Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, John. I, I'm grateful to be with you. It's a, it's a real gift um, to see you again, to see Katie. Uh, I should should note that um, <clears throat> that Katie is not only an extraordinary novelist, scholar, pal, but she's starting a, a category for a hurricane at the moment. And um, so I was complaining earlier about uh, bandwidth or something. And um, this is um, this is really really big. It's really a joy to be with you, and and I look forward to our talk. Um, I want to read just for a few minutes, not not very long, and. Uh, I don't necessarily want to fall into one-liner narratives here, but it's a sort of an auspicious time. This is a particularly sort of grading week for many people, but it's also an anniversary of sorts uh, that appears in the book. The book is about a civil rights era murder um, and the way that it impacts a community. And in a sense, it's about different people and different relationships to that trauma and how they're gonna move on. Um, I want to read a little bit about something that took place in, in 1980 that appears in the book. And, um, but uh, uh, all you need to know is that there's a, a man here who's being retried for this civil rights era murder. His name is Hare Hobbs and his daughter comes to visit him um, while he's being held. And um, they're discussing a media frenzy and how narratives are getting out. And this is a part of um, her recollections that have somehow now started to leak out. <clears throat> so it opens again with this character, Hare Hobbs. Uh, in prison. Did I ever tell you we get the newspapers in here time to time? Yeah? Yeah, it's funny how you can read about yourself only without ever having talked to any reporter. When he motioned to the guard, the walls must have ears, huh? No, Hare said, I'm talking about things only family knows. And she wondered if Hare could still reach out, if there were any men left to pay his retribution. $650, she thought a long way, that money goes a long way. She told some Atlanta-based girl reporter about the plots, the space her father had built behind the house, 15 high and 40 long cinder block, erected between their little place and the near identical house of the black family next door. It had featured massive painted images of the Confederate battle flag and Mississippi state flag crossed at arms. In the upper corners were smaller versions of the Gadsden and Bonnie Blue. And when she and Derby were kids, the plots had greeted their every glance out of bedroom or kitchen window and was the framework of every game played in the backyard. The wall was based on a structure Hare had learned about in Time Life photo book on World War II. It was a thing he wished to have seen when deployed there, only versus the Greek theater-inspired German-built amphitheaters on the pages, grand vehicles of nationalist Volkgemeinschaft. His plots was just a backdrop to their flat, weedy yard. It was when Hare still needed to speak at a time when he still roused the men. Her daddy had been so potent back then, a soldier of sorts, near legendary to an indulgence of folks who just winked when they spoke of what he'd done. Nobody really knew if Hare had murdered that man. They only knew that her daddy had walked out of court in 1965, set free by a jury of his peers, one to 11, a grin on his face and with an entire state of citizens lauding justice, an entire cast of them positioning Hare's acquittal as a glorious rebuke to Johnson's Voting Rights Act. This was back when Hare was still an icon to some despite the water on his knees, his sour breath. Back at that outskirty house she grew up in, the men had brought farm veg and venison to aid the family. Winnie remembers watching her mother stab a small knife into the meat again, again, before stuffing the slits with rolled strips of streak of lean bacon. Mother had been 16 when she gave birth to Derb, 1978. She was the la next to last in a series of spurned, angry girls who'd sought hair out and who'd treated him as landed treasure, his cachet, his heroism, their fathers having all but arranged them as tribute. You see, Hare's idea had been to erect the plots as both barrier and stage, a symbol and show of force. Inspired by his vision, the men had come to his house in mass over a series of Saturdays, celebratory efforts, and he'd fed them whole hog and beer, and they'd in turn laid concrete and metal poles and cinder block. Winnie and Derby and their mama had watched the structure rise, blocking out the neighboring house, transforming their own backyard into a rally space. This was 1980. In the wake of Reagan's speech at Neshoba County Fair just outside of Philadelphia, Mississippi, Hare hadn't attended the event, but like he, like the rest of them, had seen the frenzy on television candidate Reagan, 1980, August. 
speaking in front of 10,000 in the swelter, their paper fans wagging their cheers in legion when re the Republican candidate proclaimed, I believe in states' rights. It was a revolution, a national outcry, a tribute to be erected in the sunlight. In Reagan's speech, it re-radicalized Hare's power, breathing life into his limp narrative. Hare saw this, and he knew that he could rekindle himself, his lust for acceptance, or rather, their lust for him. For days, they'd all seen Reagan on television and in the papers, footage of 10,000 in the news clips from Neshoba screaming Reagan's name. It was genius, this so-called Southern strategy, and within a week, Hare had summoned the men to the house. He drank and he raved like a preacher. He claimed that the state's rights had returned them all back into, well, men. He waved his arms in revival and implored them to consider, just consider what Reagan's words had meant. I, he clapped, believe in state's rights. He called for a toast and they drank. And the men teemed with hope as he promised them a homecoming, a crawling back out of the heaped dirt and disrespect. The signal, he called it the return. And the future president's dog whistle speech had been broadcast nationwide, as was delivered from right there in Neshoba County. Of all the places he could go, Kennedy Reagan had spoken to the South, the nation, and the world from Mississippi, 1980. Okay. Hi. Hi. Um, so that reading um, makes me, is a reminder of how much I love your sentences. Um, in this book particularly, they are so like fast and bouncy and they have this kind of panache to them. And I'm curious if that is, how much of that is your natural writing voice and how much of that is the voice you created to fit this particular world? Um, do you think in general terms, like the way you write informs the kind of stories that you want to tell, if that makes sense. Like I often wonder um, like what I, Katie, am capable of writing about specifically in terms of tone, like what my voice can fit. Uh, I, I think it does speak to the, to the landscape and to the characters and thank you, by the way. Um, I get way, way too involved with sentences and um, as a sort of failed musician, but somebody who is who was reared on music uh, first and foremost, and who still, you know, wishes he was in that space. I think I, I really dive in and try to um, to work with these and shape them more. And and um, as may or may not happen, they, this this comes with the risk of sort of getting in the way of things. But what I find that for me and the work that I love to to read and the work that I love to hear that the sentences and the sort of musicality have to be a part of that. Um, and um, yeah, yeah. So I, I and and I hope in this case, for instance, that it lends itself to, um, if I go back and I think about someone stabbing a knife into a piece of venison, um, and I think, okay, and then they're gonna put bacon in that venison. No, they're not. They're gonna put stab strips of stricoline into stricoline bacon into the you know into the slots or something. And it's indulgent maybe, but it also suits, I hope, the story and the sound of these things that they're they're sort of unfolding. Yeah, and it's super Southern. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would call this book sort of high Southern, mm -hmm. um, which to me is not a way of like, uh, you know, relegating it to a regional literature, but of saying just that it feels so familiar to me as a Southerner. Um, this summer I read Eudora Welty's Losing Battles, um, which is 50 years old and has the exact same familiarity as if it were written today, just in terms of the cadence of people's voices, um, the little minutia of what they're concerned about on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious whether you embrace the Southern writer label or do you think it's funny or oppressive in any way? All of these things, yeah. Yeah, all of these things for sure. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly of the, the, the space and, and when I've gone, uh, I've thought about it a lot. I, I worked on this book, you know, when I was in, in Mississippi and then in Austin, and, and I had moved to Mississippi from Chicago, but then I went to, um, I took it to, to rural Italy and then took it to southern Spain and then took it to northern Morocco and um, and wound up back in Nashville. Um, and maybe it should have stayed gone. Um, but whether within or without, I'm certainly thinking about the space and I think that that has to inform the story and it has to inform um uh the character the rub of course is that you know the south is sort of particularly prone to, to one-liners or maybe not particularly but 
certainly um, it gets that way. And so you want to make a story that can, that can reach beyond and sort of represent the complexity of the space, um, even if it's, it's born of it. Um, and if I could go on, you have an extraordinary, by the way, you have this extraordinary essay uh, about these sort of tropes in Southern literature. And I love that um, you were saying, for instance, uh, this magnolia tree, like ditch it. And, and, and in my work, I said, okay, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna make the world's largest magnolia tree ever. So we both were coming at these representations and trying to say, reimagine it, redo it. Um, and I think that that, of course, uh, helps with the literature, this re-envisioning, re-imagining, sort of hyper-dramatizing, um, or maybe it doesn't help because as we know, four of the five candidates for the new Mississippi State flag have a magnolia flower on them. Um, enough about that. We should be speaking about, yeah, your questions so, are One of my next questions was about the magnolia tree, which is, I think, my favorite character in the book. Um, it is much abused. Um, and it makes you think of this idea of symbols and how Southerners cling to symbolism even when it is no longer serving them in any way. Um, and one of my favorite anecdotes about this soon to be new Mississippi State flag is that one of the 10 finalists had a giant mosquito on it. Yeah, the mosquito. And the Department of Archives was like, it was an accident, like that wasn't supposed to be one of the finalists. I was like, no, it was. It was supposed to be one of the finalists. Um, and so I'm curious as a writer um, who, you know, as writers, we, we uh, you know, our, our daily bread is in symbolism. As a writer and a Southerner, how do you grapple with um, the sort of the ways in which symbols have taken over the lives of Southerners? Sure, I, 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 I grapple with it quite a bit. I mean, until recently, though, I, I think, or one thing I grapple with now is the fact that there's really sort of a non-narrative there. You're either on the side of these symbols or you're sort of not, and. Um, so getting to that point, I think, as a Southerner, or in, in terms of literary story, and, and, and I hope, I mentioned before reading, I hope that, that I don't deliver any sort of one-liner narratives, because I think that's not fair to place or to character or to reader, um, especially when you're talking about things like region or identity. Um, but in this book, for instance, I wanted to look at the, the mansion, this mansion that had not only um, was built on the site of... Uh, of an old mansion that had been occupied and then burned to the ground, but it's trucked into town and it takes on more symbol, it takes on more relevance than, than so many other structures, simply because it's sort of bestowed as such. But it's really, it's a site of trauma, it's where this murder happened, it's a site of sort of class complications, it's a site of um, public identity, it's also a site where the person has inherited it who is from Chicago and is therefore saying, you know what, I'm gonna trash this thing. So in a way I wanted to look at physical spaces as this town, as this tree, uh, with this tree, as complicated monuments. The tree is, of course, a tree, right? But it's a site of trauma um, and it's a site of memory. It's a site of growth. It's a site of arrested growth. It's a site that can be deployed as symbol. Um, I'm thinking it's even the idea, for instance, that when I started writing this book eight, nine, ten years ago, um, I just said the urgency that I had to tell about memory, memorial, things like Confederate statues and say, these things matter to bodies. These things matter to how bodies value. And this summer, everyone knows now these things matter. And, and even that is complicated because, OK, now we know what are we doing? Um, uh, the urgency of how we address these things. You know, one thing, even in the, the multifaceted state, let's say, uh, of memorials such as houses or trees in this thing or monuments, which they appear to Colleen, this sort of Confederate monument, they're also representations of, of, of loss and impotence and failure and all these, you know, and you see people who sort of defend these monuments, like, well, you know, this is also reminding you constantly that you made this horrible mistake <laughs> and you sucked at making a horrible mistake. And like, you know, really, you wanna keep that around? I'm obviously uh, yapping too much. Symbolism is greatly important, but I think we can constantly unpack its value. And I hope that the story looks at it again, a physical tree or a house from different perspectives and says, what is this thing? How does it operate for these different families or, or people here? Yeah, and I like your point that, that symbols uh, the way they operate in the South, they're so often non-narrative, is I think the phrase you used. They're, they're, they're stuck and they don't develop. And as writers, we, we have to make things develop. Um, and I think it's what you do really beautifully in the novel. And I hope it's what we as a region can 
learn how to do. Um, I think we are learning how to do it, but slowly and painfully and with a lot of reluctance. Yeah. Um, so as always, I think that, I hope that fiction will, will lead the way forward. Um, another thing that your book deals with uh, in really interesting ways is this question of generational change um, and how people take or avoid responsibility for the sins of their ancestors. Um, you know, Hare Hobbs, the wonderfully named town villain, is on trial for murdering a black man uh, during the 1960s. And you have uh, very different responses from his two sons about what that means and what kind of legacy should be claimed. Um, so it just got me thinking, like, what does it mean to be the child of a bad man? Um, and by extension, what does it mean to be the child of a bad culture, uh, which you and I as white Southerners are? Um, so how do you grapple with that in the context of of making literature rather than like making you know a statement at the at the state capitol right 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 and i think in this case grapple yeah grapple is it's intense and it should be right i mean it should be a lifelong sort of grappling with identity and biases and privilege and things like that um as it just it, i mean to kind of take it back to the book is it, the the main character in this book is 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 Colleen, and she's a veteran, and, and I wrote about her in a story collection. I just wasn't done with her, but she comes into this story, and it's four or five years after her return from a, a deployment, and she's sort of fractured, and she's hurting, and, um, and but she's in a great relationship, a decent relationship. She's pregnant. She has a plot of land, a 30-year mortgage, and you would think that this healing needs to happen, but with the trial, we come to figure out that... Um, that it's not just a personal trauma. This becomes this sort of collective trauma, right? And, and everybody involved in this story uh, is related to, it has some intersection with that crime and it really does become this notion of complicity and this notion of how to redefine oneself against this trauma, against the legacy in this case of sort of racism, but also certainly classism and stuff like that. And so um, that was the, the part of the, the page uh, was how to, to configure different narratives in relationship to trauma, to this legacy of violence and how people work it out. And what I really wanted to do is, is A, establish complicity. And, and that's on the part, of, it goes well beyond Mississippi. I mean, there's sort of Colleen's story is a global story. Um, the guy who inherits this house is from Chicago. And we see this sort of larger complicity come to bear on this town. And what I really want to do is say, everyone is involved in the structure are there healthy ways that they can move away from it? And, um, you know, we don't want to, there's certainly not an easy conclusion. So that was part one, establishing everyone's relationship to this trauma and to this legacy and how they can move forward. Um, or the recognition just that they're sick by it. They're made sick by it. And that, that in Colleen's case, it's not the war, it's the home culture that's sort of fractured. Um, but the other thing that you want to do as a fiction writer, which, which, I think has its application is to not really provide any one-liners. Don't provide any, you know, but um, um, good, bad, whatever. These are characters I um, that that should embody humans and make these tough choices and ask us to care about the people that we we normally need to despise or need to throw away. Um, I uh, I was telling someone recently that those are the characters that matter the most and those are the writers that matter the most, the ones that ask me to care about somebody who I do not want to care about. And that sort of writ in fiction, what it maybe is to, to be writ into the South. I want to care or find better or healthier ways to care. Um, but fiction asks us to really, I mean, it forces us to, to grapple with that, um, I hope. Um, yeah, you can't get to the end of the novel until you read all the pages that deal with people that you don't want to read about. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I uh, uh, I think of the writers who I still, um, you know, I probably read, for instance, Blue Eye like 30 times. And you read these characters who you sit there and say, I'm not going to care about this person. I'm not going to care. But the comprehensive sort of humanity and detail and awareness of people who are even a, a, a part of directly or indirectly in sort of atrocity you know you just say wow um and that's the humanity that i think if you don't have to write about any of that nobody's asking us to to write these things but i think when you want to tackle them if you want to look at the legacy of the past or the legacy and how that um structures who we are 
and how bodies become valued or devalued by everything from a tree to a memorial to to um, intersections, you know, uh, across generations. Yeah, it's got to be not easy. I shouldn't say that on like a book thing. It's so easy. <laughs> it's it's wonderfully easy. Uh, yeah, yeah, but. yeah. Um, so Colleen, your protagonist, um, is incredibly written, and uh, it's just like a very sort of three dimensional, honest portrayal of womanhood. Um, in a way, again, that avoids one-liners. Uh, on the third page, I think she murders a baby squirrel. And I was like, who is this woman? Um, and so I'm curious to you, uh, whether you had any trepidation about writing women and the voices of women in ways that you thought were responsible. Of course I have trepidation. Yeah, how could you not? I mean, I think that, um, yeah, intense trepidation. I, I, um, I you know, for, for, I'll say for, Colleen wasn't even a part of this story, right? She was a part of a short story, and I spent many, many years thinking about soldiers with whom I'd served and who got a story and who didn't get a story. And I wanted to write towards um, telling maybe new war stories in, in terms of, of, of trying to spend time with that and, and how important that was to me. Um, but at the end of that story collection, I mean, she had run her car into a cornfields and was hit a, a, a irrigation sprinkler and it was done. Um, I was moving on to a new story about a guy from Chicago who inherits his house in a little town in Mississippi uh, and he's still in there. But, um, but I couldn't get over thinking about Colleen, who she was, who she would be in five years. And I think about all the folks with whom I served and other veterans I met or crossed paths with. And I would think about um, uh, uh, female soldiers who I would see after reading events and, and folks were saying, okay, you know, it was enough to say you're, I know I'm inherently flawed, but it was enough to say, you know what, if you, this was, you were hitting on some, 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 some cylinders were happening in this engine. And con concurrently what was happening is I couldn't give up on Colleen. I, I needed to know more. I needed to know who she was. So I spent a whole lot of time thinking about her. I wrote her into this novel. I spent years and years thinking about people. You know, you can only do so much in terms of research, in terms of thinking about inner talking to people, in terms of living with people, in terms of having beers with your characters and speaking to them about stuff that'll never end up in the book and like going a little, you know, as immersing as best you can and also saying, you know what? Um, somebody can, should, and will uh, knock your jaw off for doing this and say, you didn't do it well enough. And you have to be able to say, okay, you know what? I thank you. I didn't, but in this case, I certainly um, wanted to leave everything that I could in, in this character and in Colleen. And, and I felt like um, there was a combination of, of those, my relationship, my very best writing, my very best intention, and also sometimes going against what my personal experience or my personal instinct would be in order to have a separation, in order to make sure it was fiction, right? And, and to sort of force against the telling that it might be my telling. Um, yeah, and, and I don't know, she just, you know, she became, I just love her. She's like such a family member to me. Um, yeah, and so when you went from the this short story with her in it to the novel with her in it, like how much of her did you already know and how much more work did you have to do of getting to know her? Like, this is also sort of a larger process question yeah. about short stories versus novels, I guess. Yeah, um, I knew that in the original short story, she woke up after this car wreck and she drove into town and her car died in the parking lot of a beauty parlor. And in the novel, I knew that she at some point would, her car would die in the parking lot of a beauty parlor. Um, and that was about it. I think there was another page or two that, um, uh, but that was pretty much it. Um, in fact, I mean, I, I had a draft of this novel and, and, um, and I went back when I wasn't, I was in Morocco and I was like, this isn't working. This isn't working. I'm missing Colleen. And I cut 35,000 words and said, okay, we're going to reframe this thing around Colleen. Who is she? What is she doing? Where is she? Um, I know she's going to drive into a beauty parlor parking lot and she's going to have been through a wreck and she's going to meet somebody. Um, yeah. And it just so happened that it opened though four or five years later 
and I, and because that too is also like what people maybe do is they try to get past trauma in her case trauma of war she thinks and she's got again in this relationship and stuff um and then she steps on a squirrel oh don't bring that up sorry that's terrible <laughs> Um, she does nice things, I think. I don't know. Maybe she doesn't. But yeah, yeah. But that's the marker. She realizes that something's wrong when she commits this sort of horror. She's in this moment and she realizes, okay, I'm not dealing with some things. Yeah, yeah. Squirrel-wise or otherwise. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so when you're writing the novel, like, are there tricks that you learn to lean on as a writer that got you through the length of that process as opposed to writing a short story. I mean, I don't, maybe you take like eight years to write a short story too. Mm -hmm. If there's something that, that changed in the novel writing, how did you like emotionally and psychologically get through it? Not well, um, but I'm still real proud of myself for doing it. Um, I, one great thing, there were many great things, and one of them was to, to, to make those decisions such as, like, I'm going to cut a third of this book out to reframe it around a new character because, damn it, that's the story that I want to tell. Um, another one was to, to realize that, um, uh, that I needed to come up with something that I felt like I had punched above my weight, way above my weight for all its flaws and everything else. I was like, I want to write this type of story and I want to make that happen and it needs to take a while to great credit goes to um, the folks at Norton uh, because they would I'd send them stuff and they would say no you know hold on wait a second and what I did learn which was great is that there often was a chasm between someone's um, version of a story and the version that I wanted to tell. But I think for me, I thought, well, wait a second. Uh, my job is to put on um, the glasses that the other person is wearing. And it wasn't so much right or wrong as it was maintaining that I want to tell this story about this town and these people and this woman. And I want to get, I, I, I agree now, I put this lens and maybe there's an end point here I want to get to, but you can't tell me how to get there. I need to figure that out, but I, and I can figure it out. And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's 40 years and it's seven different families and it's um, different uh, uh, geographies and everybody tied into this one thing. And, and I appreciate that people would say, OK, well, if you really want to go for it, you need to make all of this stuff work and come together. And um, so I think learning that. Learning that I can get to the end point, but I just need to figure out how to get to that end point. That's still writerly, forgive me, I need to be more specific, but damn it, it's still like, I'm just like, oh, wow, so grateful. And also, damn, that was a, a really hard lesson to, to sort of scale this, this wall and get there. Yeah. Um, Are you in the process of scaling another wall? No, yes, I'm always scaling something. Um, yeah, I've got a couple, couple books that I'm working on that are not um, high multi-perspective 40 years trauma considerations that involve various monuments and, and enormous magnolia trees. Um, I've got almost a collection of short stories. I was in Italy last year and um, started, you know, as you were, novel. This world's amazing, by the way. I get to tell you this. I was here for me. This is the everlasting thing's extraordinary. Um, um, but, and put together a bunch of short stories, some of which are there and some of which are sort of set back in the south. And then I've got two early, early, early um, novels that I'm thinking about. One of them has to do with retirement in Florida. Don't everybody dance at once. And the other maybe has to do with the music industry in Nashville and sort of uh, cultural, the production of culture and what it means to kind of try to, to harness these worlds of making songs, but also selling songs. and and um, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. The writer, my, my pal Michael Knight, once he's, he's always got books coming out. And I said to him at some point, what, um, how are you doing this? He said, well, it's always good to be working on at least two, two books at a time. So I'm trying. That's but, you good. know, 10 years per book. Um, <laughs> when we next meet, I'll be the hologram of this conversation. You can ask me new questions. It will just cut and paste me into some other situation. Um, so that's to my question about pandemic life for you. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like you were actually being productive. Uh, like what percentage of your time are you being productive versus like 
compulsively cleaning the house or mm -hmm. eating a lot of donuts. Yeah, so many donuts. It's some on the donut time for sure. Um, percentage, I don't know. I'm not as productive as I want to be. I went in waves and I was really quite productive. And then um, I needed to s stop and, you know, as we all do, this thing is so intimate and so complicated. And so at one point I'm, you know, I'm really day to day. One, I wake up one and I say, why, you know, I need to do this for the book or I have this thing and the next day. So, you know, how lucky am I that like, I have a book coming out and that I get um, to spend time with my kid or I get to work on new stuff. And some days I just say, just, you know, unplug. Now, um, it's one thing that's been interesting I'm trying to write about is I experienced a, a, a type of anxiety early on that I had not experienced since my 1991 Gulf War deployment. And it was so interesting, but it's really come to bear on some stories. And, and it was funny, I felt this way. And I later that night I started laughing. I said, that's what it was. And I realized that when I had been sort of in a desert outpost middle of nowhere and these sort of missiles are coming everything depended on everybody doing the right thing and nobody could mess up because if anybody messed up we were all going to be in a really bad situation and so going out here in nashville where the party buses are happening and like people have been i was feeling that so that's a long weird way of saying i'm trying to channel that into some fiction into some sort, something that might speak to the different ways that we're all sort of intimately responding here. Yeah, um, yeah that's mostly sketches, stories that we might need to just, everybody forget that last like two minutes. Um, how, are you, how are you holding up? Oh, I'm not writing anything at all. Great. Total disaster down here. Yeah, no, I can't. I think part of what I'm really struggling with is like, uh, we're in this new reality, right? Um, that has, that has not defined itself fully yet. And yet we are writers of realist fiction. Mm -hmm. So how do you continue to write realist fiction in yeah. an era when the reality has not yet been determined? May I say that? No, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you. But you're not, but you're, you, I think the, the, the everlasting sort of deviates into this wonderful space where you're sort of stepping outside and you have these different narratives that are coming. They're interlinked across how many years? 2,000 years of, 2,000 years of Rome. And they do sort of slip into still realism, but, but spirituality and there's these different voices woven in. And I think I'm trying to do the same. I think a lot of us are doing the same. I mean, reality, time, everything has sort of become unmoored. And so I, I had a story a couple months ago in electric literature that was this sort of strange, um, departure in terms of of um of sort of i don't even know this sort of transcendence and what would come at the end of this transcendent period and would it be what we think it is or not and i think that everybody now is faced with how do i write to capture this moment i mean some people can be immediate the students that i teach are going into healthcare and that they need to be immediate i think as writers we need time to process uh, if we jump too fast into it it's going to be um maybe not as rewarding um, but I don't know, it can things can cut loose and <laughs> let go of the realism. It's gone. Okay, we're post-realistic. Let's let it go. Um, did you read Zadie Smith's Intimations? Her no, name? not yet. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's interesting. She wrote it all about the pandemic and she she published it. And some of it's right. beautiful. Yeah. Um, but she's Zadie Smith, so like I was just gonna say that. Yeah. <laughs> when I get to be Zadie Smith. I'm going to be able to process culture and produce extraordinary liter literature and feedback right, you know, right there. Yeah. Um, but no, I'm just thinking, I'm writing, I'm scribbling is what I know. I'm trying to be open actually to, to sort of drifting off of realism a little bit. If that is a, a new part of the story, that's great. Because that's another thing that I forgot is that process wise, I think we constantly have to revisit our process. Um, and uh, so that's I think, I think you're onto something with like, with absorbing mood rather than like specific details of this moment like the way it recalled something from 1991 for you is in fact a universal takeaway mm -hmm. it's not like oh how do i write about you know are people wearing masks mm -hmm. um, which feels ephemeral um so i i have every faith that you will produce great work in this era
And with that, yeah, no, I, I hope so. We'll see. I mean, right now I'm basking in, I'm looking at this book. You keep seeing me look down. Look how pretty this is. It's so cool. I was back speaking to, look. Ah, so good. Um, it was great when, when you know, it was asking me about this and I was like, I don't know, kind of spare, kind of punk rock. There's a lot of, you know, squirrels getting hurt. And they were like, this is it. Um, anyway, we'll see. Uh, I feel I feel just excited to be enjoying this sort of the basking in this one, and I it's it, I feel very lucky to, to have a few hours every day to kind of tinker around before I head back to school. Um, and uh, and we'll see, you know, we'll see. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what the South is anymore. I don't know what the space is anymore, and that may be fine. I'm not sure that it's up to me to try and figure out how to tell people what the South is. I think that I've, you know, uh, listening may be a good thing, uh, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are you, you have another Rome book, though. You have a second Rome book. I'm talking back to you. I don't get a chance to speak. I are you do. working on? It's, you? it's in the can, so to speak. Um, yeah, yeah. But like nothing matters except like what you're writing today. I find. Right. If you're yeah. not writing today, then you're a failed writer. There you go. No. no. <laughs> it's true. If you're all listening out there, that's not true. All of you are right. If you're not failing today, you're not a writer. Would that be the new motto? I think that might be that might be my new thing. Yeah. Make, we'll make bumper stickers. Right on. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, well, I'm going to throw it back to John now and see what kind of questions you're getting from the audience. <laughs> I have a couple. When does it end? That would be the, the first one. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Katie. Thank you so uh, much. Yes, thank you, Katie. Um, uh, somebody asked a question about, uh, well, about what kind of reader you have in mind uh, and whether it changed over the course of the eight, nine, or ten years that it took you to write the book. Do you have somebody in mind? Is it a reader you know? Is it a real person? Is it a fake person? Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, that's a wonderful question. It is really, a, it's been a changing question. Um, you know, you want the book to appeal and speak to, to anybody. I want anybody to pick it up and say, wow, this person did his job and, and, and I enjoyed this book. Honestly, when I started writing it and throughout most of this process, um, I'm thinking about shaking uh, the white South in particular, but also sort of white even, um, no matter their political influence, by the lapels. Um, and, and saying, hey, listen, um, we're really uh, tied into, a part of forged by this ongoing situation and, and in you know in one housing alone over the or one little housing in, in terms of this book again it's the impact of this this violence that's mid-60s violence and how it radiates through generations so certainly i wanted to um to say let's think about that let's pay attention to that who are we because of that how are different bodies um organized or or, or treated well or, or treated unwell because of that um as I mentioned to Katie earlier, that's shifted. Uh, and it's a good thing. It's a good thing that I can say to you or to anybody, hey, guess what? There's this structural legacy of privilege that exists. And we all, uh, in, in terms of race, are beneficiaries of it. And we need to question how and why that happens and how things like houses or memorials speak to that or, or what they've done in terms of our notion of identity. Um, so it's a good thing, but it certainly changes the, the, the readership. I hope the book still stands. I, I believe it does, and I think the structure still stands. But, but that's also a part of, of writing culture, right? Is, is you're going with your best, and you, and you do hopefully this job that's thoughtful and thorough and complicated and not, um, uh, but not trying to, to offer any sort of uh, saddle or Band-Aid or anything. It says, here's a story. It's complicated. I hope you like it. And then if things change, they change. Um, yeah, but that was so my, yeah, my, my readership changed, but huh. <laughs> for good. It'd be awful if people were like, oh, this guy's crazy. <laughs> Bodies don't matter. There's none of this going on. That would be a really bad situation. I've got a, a title question and a cover question. The title question is, were there any other alternative titles? I really like Some Go Home when you told me that was what it was going to be called because First, you have to wonder who some are. You have to wonder 
where home is and why they're not there. <laughs> but was there were there other titles that appealed to you? Um, you know, over the course of writing, there were several titles, and they all had to do with sort of circular time. You know, I read the part earlier about this notion of Reagan in 1980 and how that sort of came back. And and by the way, it was it was a, I started writing about this character building this wall. Um, you know eight, nine, 10 years ago. And it was just sort of horrifying when I was like, oh, wow, this wall thing is. Um, uh, so point being, it all was really circular. And this process has been talking about circular history. And I would have these files that were laps, <laughs> you know, something, circles. I would change it for a while. Uh, it was Revolver. And I, I remember asking, well, do you like Revolver? And it was like, oh, it's a great title. And then at some point, um, my editor, thank goodness, was like, yeah, ask some other people, basically, you know, uh, at large. She said, I think maybe you should rethink. I said, no, I can't possibly. And then I went and asked people who didn't care about me. And they're like, it's either a gun or a Beatles album. So I needed to get rid of that. And in the space that was um, this book, I realized everybody here has this different version of home. And, and Katie and I were speaking about the South. And um, these people don't know how to be home sometimes because their community, again, is this town is torn up by trauma and some of them don't know how to run away from it. Some of them want to split. Some want to just pretend like it never happened. So this notion of home was huge there. Um, and when I'm thinking about place and thinking about how we're defined by place and how sometimes that's both wonderful, but also it just really, uh, it kind of, kind of process or it's things that, that make us tied to, as Katie said, I think bad, um, you know, uh, new people tied to, to older problems and or complications. Um, that void was there. And of all things, this old song, this 1970s song, Jerry Jeff Walker tune that I love called Some Go Home was never hit. It's like a B-side, but it was about a soldier on a train coming back to Tennessee. And I used to listen to it in 1991 when I was coming back to Tennessee. And I thought it was for me. But the middle of the song is about a young woman is headed home and it says she's she's headed home back where life begins and ends and um and they feel that you belong to them and i felt like that really this notion that colleen feels like she's supposed to be a particular type of woman she's supposed to act a certain way she's supposed to embody these norms and those come from a small town that says here's how we want you and if you're not going to be this way, something's wrong with you. So that really just, I was like, wow, that line's tremendous. And I, and I put it, um, yeah, I was like, that's it. You got to do it. Mm. Well, I think it's a great title. Thank you. Uh, another question, the cover question. Uh, somebody's just curious about the choice of the strawberry stickered lighter. Same person also says they're not quite finished yet, but they'd like to request more of Colleen's personal diary entries. <clears throat> Were there any... Before the lighter question, were there any stories in the collection that took the form of like diary entries or epistolary stories? Um, mm, you could refer her to that. No, I mean there were some, there were some still some sort of outtakes from the story because you know you always write far more than you're ever going to use, and so there were there were things where Colleen would would engage different spaces or she would engage different people, um, um, and and we'll see. Uh, We'll see, you mean she's in command. I'm like, let's just leave this poor woman to herself. Um, um, so thank you for all these questions, by the way. That, that's, um, these are wonderful. Um, so I think right now I gotta give her a beat uh, just to be there, but about the lighter, I mean, she's one of the things she does is um, she smokes a lot throughout her pregnancy through everything. And it's funny, at some point very early on when I had come back and I, I was, uh, smoking cigarettes. I went to the VA hospital and I talked to the physician. He said, do you smoke? I said, oh yeah. And he said, he said, um, you know, you gotta give that up. And I said, I will. And I was like 22 and he was maybe 40 at the time or something. And he said, he said, but during deployment, it's awesome, right? Because it gives you five minutes to yourself where you're only engaged in this process and you're kind of in control of your body for life. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I know me too. I still smoke. I gotta quit. Um, but point being, it's sort of this ubiquitous relationship, right? To like catching a break, to catching, even more than an addiction, it's the psychological thing. So Colleen is still sort of catching that break. And also the strawberry at some point, it's no secret I've read from it before, she becomes a, um, she becomes a beauty queen in her small town in her search to try and be something other than what she is and listen to that town. Um, 
she becomes the strawberry maiden of Pitchlin, Mississippi. So I think those two images, uh, that's what happened. Were there any problems uh, that you encountered in writing the book, uh, the solution for which you found in another book? I know you're like such a great reader. Uh, was there, did you ever have like an aha moment reading like, you know, anyone? Barry Hanna, Toni Morrison, any of the writers that are your, your people that like you, you read it and thought, oh, now I know how to get over this, this issue. You know, I, I do think that that guideline of trying not to make anybody a, a punchline. Um, and again, I mean, going back to Morrison, I, I, um, and I'm not even trying to put myself on the same hemisphere by any stretch, but in terms of just learning, right? In terms of what we've learned from the people that we admire so much and worship so much. Um, I just realized when I was, when I would read somebody like Morrison, I think, gosh, I, she's given complexity and breadth and life here. And the, you know, the easiest thing to do is it's to like take an old white guy in Mississippi and say, he did it. He's a racist. I'm not. You know, and like, that's not the case at all. So I think just that principle of going back and saying, have I made these people, um, do they have meat on their bones? Are they real? Do they have flaws? Do they have um, loves? Do they have grandkids even while they're sitting to be retried for some horrific thing? Do the people that we need to champion also have, are they hobbled by, by um, shortcomings? So that was like a really big part of it. And I think when you're writing about the South, again, you want it to speak to a larger, um, space, um, because otherwise it really does become a one-liner. It becomes, uh, yeah, so I don't know. I don't think storytelling needs to be that way. That was a big learn for me. It was a big, or just a big uh, principle, you know. I think I've got one last question, but it's for the both of you. Uh, and this has been really um, and truly a pleasure. Uh, these are two of my personal favorite novels of the year so if you're watching and have any interest at all in spending some time in Pitchlin or in Rome you really can't do better than these two uh, and it's a very very interesting question I've I love love finding questions like these and it gives you each an opportunity to um to say some nice things about each other uh Elise asks I'd love to hear both of you talk about what you see in each other's writing that you most feel is missing in your own? And are you working at filling that gap or do you recognize it as essentially unattainable in your own style? Now I'll say, having read both your novels, you're, they are, they're different novels. I think you're different writers. Um, you maybe share some, some strengths. But is there anything that you notice about each other's writing that you look at and you're like, oh, I wish I could do that? Oh yeah. Oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> italiano, sempre in italiano. Sempre in italiano. Ho dimenticato tutto il mio italiano. Okay, that's it. Great. Um, so, Elise, I should uh, say, is my mother. Um, she's the world's best question asker. So, thank you, Mom. Question. Um, yeah. Uh, the thing that comes to mind first for me is Odie's humor and his like attention to like the funniest parts of contemporary life. And I think part of why I've avoided writing about con the contemporary world for so long is that I just don't feel like observant in the right way. Um, and Odie like gets into these like tiny spaces and like not only observes, but is like capable of like pulling these threads out in a way that's, that's not like voyeuristic, but just is um, very compassionate and super funny, which I think is uh, a really hard balance to strike, especially in the South when it's very easy to fall into the trap of making fun of certain aspects of Southern life. Um, and he never does that. Um, the second half of a question, can, can I, like, is that something I'm working towards myself? Um, I think with the most recent book, that's, uh, there's a, a quarter of it that takes place in the present day. And that's the first sort of contemporary writing I've really done. Uh, and it was super hard and I think it was not the best quarter of the book. Um, so I, I want to keep working at it though. I really like as a writer feeling like I'm not quite good enough yet at something. Um, so it's very invigorating to like be working on a project that you're just like not there yet. 
Um, so yeah, I, I hope to grow up and be like Odie one day. <laughs> no, we can't. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and uh, it really is just uh, a gift to me for you to say that I feel I don't know how much time we have here. Um, I know it's not much, but you know, one of the things that I think uh, that Katie's work does, which is extraordinary to me, and I think I fumble through it, and I think even when I read that excerpt, you would fumble through me jamming in this sort of history into a narrative and trying to make it seamless and yet not knowing my gut and, and necessarily, or I'm working on my gut sometimes to say, how do I merge culture, history, fact, fiction? How do I know how to, to uh be responsible but also like engaging and dynamic when telling a story and i think katie's work does that um you know and in, in no matter the setting no matter the area you can sit there and you know you know even though katie's not going to the story's not going to say look at me history look at me factoid it's going to be this this you know tidal wave of extraordinary storytelling craft uh, you know humanity character that's coming and and yet you know the authority of it is all there like katie knows all of this and and it's this undercurrent that is this sort of just um it's there without needing to call its attention and that is just extraordinary the other thing is is that when i'm sitting here writing about the south thus far and i say gosh i wonder I know this, or I, I, I know some of the literature here. I know a lot of the music. I'm mostly of this place. Can I get beyond this place? I don't know. And I feel really insecure. And then I think about like the everlasting. And I'm like, here's 2000 years of Rome. And this, these, these wonderfully interlinked stories that are, that are coming together. And so the ability to not only do that in one sort of, uh, you know, primary <laughs> wheelhouse, but to, to take that skill and that storytelling and that sort of authority and weave it in um yeah um it's uh it's pretty all right um i don't want to be like if i get any more um excited f to be your reader i'm gonna get i'm gonna get pretty mad about how good you are at doing it so let's just stop there yeah that's something i would just love to do i would love to tell compelling stories that are authoritative and informed just in that seamless flow and that engaging way I'm working on it. I'm working. <laughs> well, Katie and Odie and everybody who tuned in tonight, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. I hope you will all buy some go home from McNally Jackson at McNallyJackson.com. Also, please buy The Everlasting. They really are two of the very best novels to come out this year. Uh, you won't regret it. And thanks again to everybody for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, John. Good to see you. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Yes. Ciao, ciao. 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 Bye. <laughs>